Hello and welcome to The Global View on this Wednesday. Well, taking a look at the macro picture, US Treasury yields surged after US retail sales rose a more than expected 0.7% last month as households boosted purchases of motor vehicles and spent more on eating out. Excluding cars, fuel and food services, core sales rose 0.6% in September, adding to a bond market sell-off. The yield on the 10-year Treasury note around 12 basis points higher at 4.83% in the two-year rose to 5.21%. And in further signs of a robust US economy, factory production increased more than expected in September, despite strikes in the car industry, manufacturing output rising 0.4% last month. The US dollar rose against the Japanese yen, but ended lower against the euro, with investors now focused on speeches by Fed Reserve officials this week. The Aussie dollar? trading higher at 63.7 US cents. Investors, of course, also watching developments in the Middle East with Palestinian health authorities saying an Israeli airstrike killed about 500 Palestinians at the Gaza City Hospital. This comes ahead of US President Joe Biden's visit to Israel later today. All right, for more on the bigger picture, what we should consider, particularly uh, as third quarter earnings season is underway in the States, Chad Petowitz joining us from Talaria Capital. Chad, Good to catch up with you again. So Morning. taking a look at some of that data that's coming out of the States at the moment, what are you focused on in particular? Yeah, well, look, certainly the, the data as of now, uh, you know, is quite mixed. There's, as you mentioned, there is some, uh, you know, strength uh, in certain parts of the economy. Unemployment still remains low. However, we are still, you know, our view is still on the bigger picture that very high interest rates that, that have kept increasing will continue to create um, an impact into the economy as time goes on. There is a long lag between interest rates and the economy of 18 months to 24 months. So we're only entering that period now. So we think it's still very prudent to expect, uh, you know, uh, you know, to expect that the economy is going to weaken in the months and quarters ahead. And with that, unemployment will start getting impacted. And there's a lot of data points and leading economic indicators that tell you that now is a time to actually be somewhat more concerned about the future, even if the existing data right now uh, is, is somewhat more mixed. All right, I see you're actually taking a closer look at what's going on, particularly with home building at the moment. What are you seeing there? Yeah, well, look, uh, intuitively, it, it makes sense that home, you know, the housing industry would be most impacted or the first impacted from higher interest rates because it's, there's a direct link between uh, buying a house and mortgage rates. And when one looks at the uh, NAHB, you know, the Association of Home Builders, the various indices of, you know, desire to build a house, to, to build a house, to buy a house, uh, to uh, uh, affordability, all of that data is is at sort of around G, around the GFC type levels. So it's very very weak. So the housing market, which always tends to lead the economy into a downturn is telling you that that segment of the market is very weak and that does make sense when one looks at what mortgage rates are are, are at now more broadly of course uh, pressure particularly in terms of credit conditions at the moment we know the consumers under pressure what are we seeing though for small businesses chad yeah so the small businesses um you know in the uh the various surveys on that as well show that sentiment is quite low. They are quite concerned about the, uh, the consumer on the go forward. But aligned to that is the availability of credit is actually been impacted significantly. So the uh, loan officers surveys which come out which say the availability and desire to lend to small businesses is dropped significantly, which makes sense. Uh, but also you have a refinance risk going on that when, you know, lo- business loans come due, if they, you know, they tend not to be very long term loans. If they were at sort of three, four, five percent, now they're three, four percent higher than that, like six, seven, eight percent. So the refinancing ability is tough. The refinancing uh, cost will be much higher. And the sentiment from the companies themselves in terms of the demand side is more challenging. So all of that does paint a picture of of probably a far more challenging period uh, going into next year. Now, Chad, of course, uh, earnings season now underway in the States. Uh, we've certainly had a raft of banks already report. What are you watching? Yeah, look, the most important thing I think to look at is the forecasts and guides uh, on the go forward, because, you know, unemployment is quite low at the moment. The economy is still doing OK. So one wouldn't necessarily expect the current earnings season. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of 
always generally be some, you know, each side some very big misses and very big uh, beats and so on. But broadly speaking, we wouldn't necessarily think that there would be a, a significant issue in the current earnings season. But what we are looking at is what companies are forecasting and looking at into the future and their spending plans. And and we're also looking at what they're doing with their capital. Are they investing? Are they, are they retaining capital? Are they paying down debt? Which gives you an idea of you know, of how they see things and how they're adjusting to that. And we'll only know a bit more of that, obviously, in the next two or three weeks as the as the earnings uh, come through. Chad, I see that in particular you're focused on the uh, results from Chubb. It is, uh, well, the largest uh, property and casualty insurance company in the world. Uh, why Chubb? Well, broadly, as I've said, we, we are quite concerned about the economic environment and the earnings environment. So we are, we do prefer companies that have a lower duration, which has been how close you are to your money, lower PE, uh, higher effective free cash flow yield, good track record, less uh, less exposure to the uh, to bad debts. For instance, in the financial side, so Chubb is an insurance company. It benefits from higher interest rates because their their balance sheet is effectively substantially made up of fixed income. So as these bonds that they own roll over, they get a much higher interest rate. So the income from that goes up. The availability of liquidity has reduced basically globally. And that allows, you know, in terms of insurance, uh, those who have the money to provide it obviously are, 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 are better placed. And that is why insurance prices partly have also gone up. So you've got both sides of the income statement, the, the pricing power of insurance, the interest rate increase uh, of their uh, balance sheets improving. The company trades on around 11 times earnings. Um, it's, been de- it's been buying back shares and increasing dividends, you know, basically for over 20 years. And it's a it's just a very high quality, well run company that you can buy at an attractive price that is not overly impacted by the economic issues we're having at the moment. And if anything is actually getting a tailwind from that. Chad, great to get your view there from Talaria. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, now let's uh, get across uh, what went on uh, on Wall Street in particular overnight, more broadly in the States, uh, with uh, obviously better than expected retail sales and those solid earnings numbers for his take. We caught up with Howard Silverbat from S&P Global. The treasury just keep going up. There's a lot of pressure on One, the U.S. government keeps spending and borrowing, and every week more treasuries are coming in. Individuals are being attracted by that. They're getting... Uh, you know, on a 10-year, 4.8%, they're getting five, almost 5.6% on a, uh, uh, a six-month. So they're going from equities. We're seeing the drains come from ETFs and funds and going into treasuries. Uh, so those rates uh, just keep going up on there, and that's creating and having an impact on equity flows uh, as they go, even during earnings season, you know, when uh, usually you get a lot of volume, people coming in and reallocating. Uh, people are sitting on the side. How we'll get to earnings in just a moment, but also got some economic data as well. Retail sales, uh, that strength there coming in stronger than expected. Um, also manufacturing showing overall resilience, I guess, that robustness for the uh, US economy at the moment. Yeah, and the uh, utility was up there, the uh capitalization on numbers, but the, but the retail one is the real one that really set the, the market up and had a big impact. Also on those rates that we were discussing, uh, the retail sales were up 0.7%, expected to be 0.3%. Uh, e-commerce was much higher. There were some laggers in there, but basically it showed a continuing spending by consumers. Again, not all areas, but a willingness to spend. Uh, jobs are plentiful, uh, labor costs are going up, and wages, obviously. Uh, and that's showing a much stronger, resilient economy underlying. Uh, and that changed the Fed's look as well. If you notice, the, uh, the Fed probabilities now have moved out all the way to the first increase, not uh, decrease, excuse me, the first decrease going into uh, the third quarter of next year. Well, we don't expect any kind of an increase this November. December and January is definitely on the table now, especially with this. The January uh, probability went up to 50% after the retail numbers go came in. Again, the economy is strong. People are spending. 
uh, and, and that's keeping the economy a lot hot, hotter and inflation higher than the Fed wants. Howard, also that political turmoil there in the States, given that, that uh, the Speaker's chair remains vacant. What's, what's going on there and what's the, what's the, the uh, consequences of that? Uh, I, I didn't think you people would do so, Bob, but uh, obviously we do here. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, the, the Speaker's uh, position is still open. He did get uh, 200 votes and need 217, which means there's deal to be made. Uh, the question is, will they be able to do it by next week? By next week, if you don't have the speaker, you, uh, you're not going to be able to pass legislation and get things through. Not just Ukraine and Israel, but other uh, legislation that's sitting there waiting to get done. So there's really a big backup on there. So the pressure is coming down between now and the end of uh, the week. If we do not get a new speaker uh, by the end of the week, the expectation is that They'll come together and make a temporary one that has some powers uh, to pass some legislation, at least bring them to vote. Or, uh, and this is a concern that Republicans will go to the Democrats, they'll cut some kind of a deal. All they need is another seven, eight more votes uh, to come onto their side. And in doing so, the Republican Party will be even more split. So you'll basically have a three party uh, control Democrats and a two in the Republican side, a majority minority in, inside there. So it's really getting to be testy there. It's starting to have effect in that there's planning going forward. What if we don't get budgets? What if we don't get allocations? What if we can't pass uh, spending bills for either Ukraine or Israel? Uh, so again, it's very tense and it's all behind doors so that you know there's deals being made. That's uh, Howard Silverblatt from S&P Global, particularly with his assessment of what's going on in Washington at the moment, and more broadly, obviously, also with those geopolitical events which continue to unfold. Let's just a quick check of the markets before we uh, leave you there. We are expecting a higher open. Uh, Spy Futures currently up more than a quarter of a cent. Stay with us. The open is just around the corner. <laughs> 